Right, good morning. My name is Sarah Croson and I'm pleased to also introduce my colleague Simon Dennison. And the subject of our research was how we look at our teaching practice for level five learners and how we mo make the absolute most of the very precious teaching time we have with them. So we looked at how we can identify any grey space in our classroom and how we can transform that and make that work for every student, in particular those perhaps from non-traditional backgrounds, perhaps who don't feel quite so confident. Sorry. So um, I'd like to pass you on to Simon, who will tell us a little bit about our context. Okay, so the research that we're going to be presenting briefly today uh, it forms part of our wider strategy for meeting the college and our department aims. So it's helpful to just start by saying who we are, what, what our aims are. Hereford College of Arts is where we're from. It's a small independent art college, about a thousand students. Um, fantastically vibrant place to work. Students come to study a range of practical subjects, fine art, graphic design, textile design, all these kind of things. Uh, we have HE and FE divisions, but they're very separate. They're on separate campuses, separate staffing. Um, Sarah and I both work in HE, so that's the context we're going to be talking about now. And our department is critical studies. So that is the academic side of the art school experience. In other words, thinking about art, writing about art, rather than actually making it. And uh, critical studies forms a very large part of every student's uh, degrees. So it's 25% of every student's um, module credits for every level, from level four to level six. Very significant. Okay, so our students, um, the, the main challenge, I suppose, that we face has been touched on by both the previous speakers, which is, is engaging our students with the, in having the confidence to engage in academic practice, serious academic practice at HE level. It is a challenge that, as we've heard this morning, is faced across the HE and across the FE sectors. It is, uh, what, for, for reasons you all are aware of, of course, the increase in student numbers, many students coming from non-traditional backgrounds, such as BTEX, and also, in our case, lots of students who are mature students coming into uh, study after having spent many years out of education. Particular issue in an art college, because um, art colleges have a high incidence of dyslexia, and other statemented conditions that impact on students' confidence to engage in academic practice. Um, and also, more general thing is that students come to our college to study fine art or photography, to make things, rather than to write essays and to engage in academic practice. Um, so, um, so our challenge is, is to really engage them in the, in the benefits of that. Right, now, that's our students. We, just to be, give you a balanced picture, we do have many gifted students, many students who come to us with previous degrees, with master's degrees, so we do see students across the ability range academically, but as a general rule, it's probably fair to say we have lots of students who come with barriers to learning, barriers to having that confidence. So, right, we like a challenge, and we have in, embraced this challenge by setting the highest possible academic standards. You're probably all aware that there's been, um, there's been a move within HE institutions over the last five years to dispense with traditional essay writing, particularly to dispense with dissertations, um, on the grounds that um, they're just seen as kind of too challenging for our contemporary diverse student population. We don't believe in this at all. And we've, in, we've retained the dissertation. We've, we even celebrate it as a sort of the gold standard vehicle for um, sustained critical thought and for transformational learning experiences. And we believe that all students from whatever background are capable of having that transformational experience. And so that's that's our challenge, that's our, our aim.
Okay, two minutes is over. Um, so, I was talking about... Okay, uh, talking about trying to enable all students from whatever background to have that transformational learning experience that is possible through setting the very highest academic standards. And what we try to do is to, what we believe we should do, is to create the right sort of learning environment that enables students, all students, to have the confidence to engage in that. Just before handing over to Sarah, I'll just say that how well are we doing? We've been finding that uh, from the kind of middle to top end of the ability range, we certainly are seeing masses of evidence of students really having those transformational experiences. I wish I could show it to you, but last year I made a, a film uh, interviewing graduating students about their experience of studying a, a dissertation, in, in undertaking a dissertation. And they all spoke with an incredible level of satisfaction, even joy, about the life-changing experience they'd they'd had from doing it, um, which, so, so clearly uh, uh, for, for many of our students we are reaching that, but and we believe we are making progress with students from the middle to kind of lower end of the ability range, but there is more work to do and that's what our research is really uh, adding to. So I'll now hand over to Sarah to let you know uh, some thoughts on that. Okay. So we started by talking about grey space. We have to make the absolute most of every single minute we have with our students because we have to get everybody thinking critically and we have to bring this huge range of learners all up to a standard where they're confident to undertake the dissertation and really benefit from that and the link it has with their practical work. So we identified areas, we asked students, where aren't you learning? Where are you less engaged? And the answers won't come as any surprise. They were less engaged in the middle of classes when they kind of drifted off and towards the end when they were tired because our, our lectures have a high theoretical content and they're quite busy as well. There's a lot going on. We got some wonderful responses. I loved the experience of asking my students what they felt about my classroom. It was brilliant. The responses I got back were not to a pattern, they were a little bit off the wall, but they really gave me some great ideas. And the students, as you've already said, I think, they loved this. They felt immediately very engaged in the classroom. I'd like to sort of have an open question. We don't have time to sort of pause and workshop this, but if, you, if there were grey areas in your classrooms, where do you think they were? If you take anything out of this presentation, I'd want you to go back and start thinking about where your students would identify when they're learning least and what you can do to change that. We have another slide, thank you. So, what we did in our context is we looked at ways to break down the barriers between the tutor and the student. Because they're nervous, non-traditional learners, we base these on action learning sets, which is something I'm very, very fond of as a practitioner. These very semi-formal discussions, there is a pattern to them, but it's quite loose. You can have a kind of guided, tutor-facilitated discussion within action learning sets. They're taken from Reg Revens. This also, we wanted to develop independent learning skills. We wanted to get them talking and working with each other, not with the tutor. So we said, OK, grey spaces. We won't send you out on a break. We'll bring the break to the classroom. We provided tea and coffee. Very interesting. A thrill for the first three weeks. Everybody raced to the tea and coffee. But I've got photographs afterwards where students just didn't bother anymore. They, it wasn't about the tea and coffee. What the tea and coffee was was a signifier for this was an informal social gathering with a tutor as a peer where you could talk freely and share your ideas regardless of your level of learning. You know, confident students, there's not an issue there. Confident students will speak up in a lecture environment. But we're not really, we're interested in them. We're looking at the less confident ones who will open up with a cup of tea and a biscuit. It sounds as if it's homespun wisdom, but there's a lot of kind of quite extensive research about this cultural significance of breaking bread, and that's what we did. So we looked, it supported these boundaries, the teacher as facilitator and mentor rather than the teacher as traditional pedagogue. It 
did support peer, uh, enable peer support, one of the most wonderful things that happened for my control group is they went off and set up a Facebook group where they discussed ideas given to them from Simon's lectures. That's fantastic. We're talking high-level theory discussed on Facebook independently. Those students may not be the most high-flying students, but they jumped grade boundaries from level four to level five, and I believe that's because of their peer support, their strong peer support. And they, three very nervous students stood up at our recent dissertation conference and told their peers what they had done. And it was great to watch that. It did support confident critical discussion. Now, I'm not going to go into the way we gather data. I've got a website, it's very comprehensive. We paired groups, we had control and trial groups. Um, we did find that it led, our results, which I'll show you in a minute, led to very innovative ways to support students. So we usually have drop-in workshops, we have tea parties, we had dissertation tea parties. 42 students came to, dissertation, to a dissertation drop-in tea party photographs of them on the website, sitting on the floor in a blanket. They were talking about their ideas for the dissertation. So the research has had an impact on how we deliver the programme. But more than that, it's, it's created a kind of buzz where students are talking to other students without a tutor present. Can we go to key findings? When it comes down to data, we did assess on attendance between control and... Um, test groups. We assessed on self-assessment of metacognitive awareness. We assessed on summative assessments as well, and that's level five, their first assessment and their second assessment. So we had a range of kind of strategies for data collection, and if you want to see those in more detail, they are up on the website, along with the first sort of gathering of data, of where are the grave spaces. What we found is that students loved this. We had incredibly positive feedback. And we believe that it increased student confidence for that crucial area who are pass-fail borderlines. Because again, in terms of summative assessment, high flyers and middle ground, it didn't really affect. They liked it, it was great, it didn't affect their results. But on pass-fail borderlines, more students passed in, or I did, we did two groups, so two control and two test groups. More students passed in both groups. And although we didn't include this in the data, the students who did fail, came for support even though they failed. So they, I believe because of this they will have a better chance of passing their research. Students, see the self-assessment, so it's, you know, it's lots of variables, but students who were in the test groups all said they had a better, improved their metacognitive ability and that's what we actually teach, we teach critical thinking. So they felt they had improved their critical awareness through participating in this sort of non-formal learning. Right, so, I ask a question for everybody here, along with the link to our website, please go and have a look around the website, post any questions you have for myself or Simon, but what do you think in your context, in our context, informal learning was right for us? Your context will be different, so my question to you will be, what do you think you might trial to replace your own grey space if you find some. Thank you, I thought that was fascinating. Um, what were the most surprising answers you got to questions from learners about grey space or about feeding back on their experience? A lot of students wanted to talk a lot more. It was an emphasis on this wish for critical discussion and to challenge themselves through critical, critical discussion. They had a great wish to break up the pace of the session. Um, it was equally interesting that um, some, some learners like traditional lectures which I was never expecting to get. I was expecting lots of learners say, we want some action learning. But a couple of learners said, no, I, I really like the long lectures. They're great. I get a bit tired at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I used to teach low level, like level two, three art students, yeah. and a lot of those had dyslexia. 
And when I see them now coming through to university and doing the dissertations, their ideas are amazing, their critical thinking is amazing, but the actual 15,000 words is daunting. How do you get past that? We break it down. Right. We break it down into small chunks and we encourage them to talk as much as they possibly can. And I, we encourage them to talk with a critical friend. Identify first at level five a peer support group that can discuss ideas critically and then have a critical friend amongst their peers who has a different skill set, who perhaps right. is lacking in those initial ideas but is much better at getting a straightforward Amazing. out on paper. Absolutely. Once those ideas can be talked and committed to memory, it's an arduous process. There's more sort of chunks in the process mm -hmm. but the written work can happen. And I think it can support these learners because it supports with the organisation organisation of their ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's probably also fair to say that we have a, um, a learning support yeah. department and so dyslexic students do have one-to-one -one support right. with, a, with a learning support tutor and that helps mm -hmm. them enormously. So, um, so the, the student will typically go to their learning support tutor and explain the ideas. Right. So they don't actually have to do the writing. Okay, but, but what we're trying to do is to give them the confidence to to engage in the research and the mm -hmm. thinking yeah. so that they don't actually have to go through the writing. And there are also a range of technologies that, that, that our college has in place. I mean, Claro Read allows them to, I'm sure you know, mm -hmm. things. So there's a range of strategies we use for a statement of students. Can I just pick up on, because uh, I was really interested in how there seemed to be um, similarities in what we were all saying. I mean, I, I, I certainly um, was very interested in your comment that it's motivation that you saw as, as a key problem and, and something that you said about uh, students really wanting that kind of inclusive approach. I mean, we, I think we believe quite strongly that there are two key um, ingredients to getting students at that kind of lower end to really engage. And one is motivation. One is really providing the learning environment, including a very inclusive approach that, that gives them that confidence. And the second thing is develop, fostering their kind of self-efficacy, this kind of sense mm. of independence, by developing their critical thinking. Because as, as, as soon as they can feel and recognise that they are themselves successfully tackling intellectual problems, then that gives them a huge boost. Yeah. And I think those two ingredients together are the two key building blocks that you need to work with. 